Welcome to Decred in Depth, your source for all things Decred. I'm your host, Angelo, and on today's show, I'm interviewing Decred developer Luke Powell. Luke is currently responsible for handling Politea's development and infrastructure. I hope you enjoy this conversation as we dig into Politea and Decred's contractor model. What's going on, everyone? This is Decred in Depth. I'm your host, Angelo, and I am sitting here with Decred developer, Luke Powell. Luke, how you doing? Doing well. Thanks for having me on. Of course. So let's get right into it. Um, let's talk about your background and your intro into the cryptocurrency space. Sure. So um, like a lot of people, I first found out about Bitcoin during the 2013 run-up when it broke $100 for the first time. Um, I was in college at the time, um, and that's when it got on my radar, but didn't really start going down the rabbit hole till a little bit later. Um, I didn't do computer science in college. I didn't start programming until a little bit after college. And so once I started getting more into software development, that's when I really started um, following the cryptocurrency scene more. And then the book, The Sovereign Individual, is really what made me start going down the crypto rabbit hole. And I never came up after that. And how did you first hear about Decred? So I first heard about Decred um, when Jake did a, the Coinbase presentation in early 2017. That's what got it on my radar. I just saw that on YouTube um, and started looking more into the project. And about mid-2017 is when I want, decided I wanted to start actually getting involved. Um, I'd been following the cryptocurrency space pretty heavily since early 2016. And I knew that I wanted to get involved with a project. So I was trying to figure out, you know, where I might be able to fit in. Um, and Decred appealed to me for a couple reasons. Um, one, the concept of the DAO just fascinated me. Um, this concept of organizing this global labor force in a decentralized manner, having this built-in funding mechanism. Um, it, it was kind of this type of entity that we'd never seen before. And so that fascinated me. And then two, the quality of the Decred team. Um, as a developer, um, the way I looked at it was that the original Decred developers are, it, they're an outstanding world-class team. And there are very few projects where I could get involved and actually have the, the opportunity to work with a team like that. Um, Decred was still small enough where I'd be able to work with them, learn from them, um, and actually be able to make meaningful contributions to the project. And then on top of that, the fact that I could get paid for those contributions, that kind of sealed the deal. Absolutely. So when did you dive into computer science if, it, if college was not it? Yeah. So I did civil engineering college, um, worked in the oil and gas industry afterwards for a little while, didn't enjoy that at all. Um, and after I decided I wanted to leave the oil and gas industry, and that's when I started exploring more programming and getting into that. As I understand, I know Decred has several development teams. How are those teams assembled, broken up, and what are some of the responsibilities that come with Sure. With the teams. So Decred works on this contractor model, right? We don't, there are no full-time employees. Everybody that works for Decred is a Decred contractor that gets paid in Decred. Um, and we don't have a formal hiring process. You, you know, we don't look at resumes. We don't look at your background. The only thing we care about is your ability to actually code and contribute on the development side of things. Um, other areas of the project like marketing are a little bit different. But the way it works, if you're a developer, is if you want to get involved with the project, anybody can come and start contributing, but it's not you know, a traditional role where you show up and people will say, here, do this, this, and this. Um, it's a role where you have to come and you have to be able to prove that you can add value to the project. You have to be able to go in yourself and start contributing on your own, um, figure out what part of the project you wanna work on and actually start you know, adding value to, to the project. So there are different all kinds of different repos um, that represent, you know, the what you could consider the products of Decred. Um, so you have DCRD, DCR Wallet, um, the iOS and Android apps, the desktop application, wallet application. You have Politea. Um, you have DCR Data, and so the way that these repos work is they they all run pretty independently um, as their own team. So a, a repo will typically have a, a lead developer. Um, for example, on Politea, that's Marco. On DCRD, that'd be Dave. Um, on DCR Wallet, that'd be Jay Rick, um, and, and so on. And so it's really up to that lead developer to run that repo however they want to. Um, and so you kind of have these little kind of uh, 
micro cultures within each repo. Um, they do things differently, um, and it's really up to that lead developer to to set the tone. Understood. And what are some of your responsibilities as a as a developer? Sure. So I work on Politea which I'm sure we'll talk about in a second. Um, and like I said, Marco is the lead developer for the Politea repo. He has actually recently been uh, taking a step back um, from the day-to-day -day stuff to focus on other parts of the project to get some other things going. Um, and so I've taken over a lot of the day-to-day -day just uh, tasks such as reviewing PRs, um, writing code myself, uh, managing all the GitHub issues, and just making sure that development flows smoothly. So now, for those that don't know, what, what is Politea? So Politea is, it's our off-chain governance platform. That's kind of a horrible way to describe it. But what that actually means is that, so Decred has this network treasury, and Politea is how we figure out how to spend those funds. It's how we, it's how we organize um, and coordinate this global contractor network in a decentralized manner. And so the way it works is, if you're a contractor or you're a, a contractor team and you want to do work for Decred, what you'll do is you'll write up a proposal and you'll submit it to Politea. Politea is our proposal system. You can think of it similar to, um, it has like a Reddit-like interface where you, you, know, you can go on, you can submit proposals, other community members can go make comments, um, make suggestions. The, the proposal author can incorporate feedback, edit their proposal, and at some point, what they'll do, do what they'll do is they'll actually start a voting process where the Decred stakeholders, the people who actually own Decred and are locking it up and actually staking it, will use their tickets in order to vote on which proposals to approve, so which teams to fund, which projects to fund, um, and so. It allows the Decred stakeholders to coordinate this global labor force and to set the direction of the project. So now, what are some of the features that we could expect within Politea? Politea um, was designed with transparency and auditability in mind. So it looks like a normal website on the surface, but it's got a lot of different things going on behind the scenes. So on a normal website, you would have all of your data stored in a database, right? Which is gonna be optimized for performance. Whereas with Politea, what we do is we actually store all the Politea in Git repos on the back end. So this allows us to do a couple things. One, it means that all of the data is gonna be versioned, meaning you can track exactly how proposals changed over time. And then it also means that we can push all of this data to a public GitHub repo and make it available to anyone who wants to go and download it and then independently verify um, a lot of this data that's on Politea, like independently verify the votes and things like that. So in addition to storing all of the data in these Git repos and making it publicly available, um, all the Politea data is also periodically timestamped onto the Decred blockchain. So what that means, if you're not familiar with timestamping, is uh, timestamping is a way to cryptographically prove the authenticity of data so that a certain set of data existed at a certain point of, in time. And it uses uh, hash functions, Merkle trees, and a blockchain to do this. So the way it works, if you're not familiar with what those are, um, a hash function is just a, a cryptographic function that takes a variable length input and then outputs a fixed length string of alphanumeric characters. So you can run a single sentence through a hash function or you can run an entire book and it will output the same length uh, set of alphanumeric characters, although the, the what, it's out, what it outputs will actually be different. And so what's important about a hash function is that they're called one-way functions, meaning the only way to get an output is to use that same exact input. And you can't go backwards. You can't take a, an output and figure out what the input was just by looking at it. And so what this means is if you want to, um, you know, cryptographically prove the authenticity of data, that data existed at a certain point in time, what you can do is you can run it through a hash function, take that output, and then include it in a Decred transaction so that it gets included on the Decred blockchain. So this is what we call timestamping. So that means that you have, because the Decred blockchain is gonna be immutable, right? You can come go at a later date and pull that hash that, hash that is timestamped on the Decred blockchain and you can you can prove that this input that I used existed at this point in time when this block was added to the blockchain. 
So again, it's just a way to cryptographically prove that data existed at a certain point in time. And then the way that you can make this scalable, and this is what DCR time does, is you can use what we call a Merkle tree um, so that you can submit an arbitrary number of documents um, in a, and include it in a single hash that gets timestamped onto the blockchain. So a Merkle tree is just, it takes a bunch of individual hashes and then through a process of combining two hashes, running it through the hash function again to get one hash. So you're starting with two, ending with one, and then you keep doing that all the way until you get just a single hash that represents all of the documents, an arbitrary number of documents. That's called the Merkle root. You take that Merkle root, you include it in a Decred transaction, and that Merkle root gets timestamped onto the Decred blockchain so that at any point in time, you can go and you can prove the existence of any of those original documents that were used in the Merkle tree. And so that's what we do for Politeia. That's what DCR time does. Every hour, it takes all of the Politeia data, um, hashes it down, use, uh, makes a Merkle tree, and then timestamps that Merkle root onto the Decred blockchain. So that means that you can cryptographically prove that Politeia data, that this Politeia data existed at this block of the Decred blockchain. So now, how do you feel that Decred and Politeia are creating a new form of human organization in comparison to legacy companies? Because this is a decentralized organization that we're working with here. Right. So the way that I look at this is that this concept of a you know, decentralized autonomous entity, basically what Decred is, is a evolution of the, a, a company, of the concept of a company. So a company or a corporation is a framework for incentivizing value creation. It allows people from you know, all different backgrounds to collaborate together and pursue a common goal of you know, maximizing shareholder value. And you know, the, the company framework has you know, played a huge role in creating the, the prosperity that we see today. So a cryptocurrency network, and specifically Decred, is kind of like a next iteration of what a company could be. And what I mean by that is that a cryptocurrency network, it's a it also a value creation framework where um, it incentivizes value creation from a global set of people. So it allows people from all over the world to collaborate together and pursue a common goal of maximizing network value where different projects will pursue different specialties in order to do this. Decred is pursuing um, the hard money store of value use case. But uh, you know, at its core, uh, it's, it's a way, it's still a value creation framework where um, you're incentivizing value creation in a in a reality where borders and um, identity politics don't matter, right? So Decred has this global contractor network, and Decred is one of the few projects where you can actually contribute as a pseudonymous individual. Um, actually, a lot of the people that I work well, not a lot. I'd probably say, you know, a handful, definitely. a handful of the people I work with. Um, I have no idea who they are. I have no idea. Uh, what country they live in, what race, gender, na nationality, religion they are. Um, and I actually really enjoy that now that I've had that experience. It lets you, it, it takes biases completely out of the equation. Um, everybody has biases, you know, and trying to ignore your biases is very difficult. It's much easier to just take it totally out of the equation. And then it allows you to have these relationships where you're interacting with people solely based on their ideas and their, their contributions. Um, and I, I really enjoy that. Yeah, I have to agree with you. That, that, is, that is something special. Um, in what ways do you expect Decred's governance model to be tested? Well, as Decred grows as a project, um, you know, the more money that is on the line, kind of the the more the governance model will be tested. Um, you know, we'll have different actors coming in, you know, stirring the pot, causing trouble, um, trying to plant those seeds of discontent. Um, and that's that's going to be as you know, Decred really starts blowing up. That's going to be one of the tests of its governance model. But I think we're, we're set up pretty well to be able to handle um, basically any type of uh, community disputes. That's what Politea is. That's what on-chain voting is. It was all designed around this, this concept of a way to uh, arbitrate these types of community disputes in a manner where your decision-making ability is directly proportional to the amount of skin in the game you have. So it aligns interest. Um, the people who are making decisions about the risk are the same people that will feel the consequences of that risk. So the one thing I really actually enjoy about Decred is that if a, a fight does pop up in the community, um, 
a great, great way to end it is just to say, okay, cool. If you believe this, go make a proposal and put it all in Politea. And you can't really argue with that because then you'll let the decred stakeholders decide. Um, I think that's great. Now, some, what are some of the real world use cases for DCR time in Politea? Right. So obviously we're using it for governance, um, but it actually does have a lot of other use cases or could be. We designed it in a way where it, particularly um, the the versioned timestamp file system part, we designed that as a separate daemon so that anybody who needs to be able to version documents and then have them automatically timestamped onto the Decred blockchain periodically can take what we uh, this this daemon, it's called Politea D, um, run it on their own, and then they can either build their own front end for it, or we have CLI tools that allow you just to submit arbitrary documents to it, um, and it takes care of everything else. So, you know, this could have a lot of applications in the corporate world, basically anywhere where a company would want to be able to cryptographically prove the authenticity of data, or data that this data existed in this exact form, um, be able to prove that at a later date. So data integrity of documents, um, which kind of has all kinds of, it's a very broad use case. So now pivoting back to discussing being a part of this community and becoming a contractor, how was it that you became a contractor for Decred? Sure. So um, like I mentioned previously, I first found out about Decred early 2017. By mid 2017, um, I knew that this is the project that I want to start contributing to. Okay, how do I do that? And the way I went about it is, and the way other people should probably go about it is the first thing is just get involved in the community. Um, start learning about the project, start interacting with people on Matrix, um, and just start learning the culture of Decred. That's really important. Um, we've If you try and come in um, and say, we've had people do this and it never works out well, where people come in and say, you guys are doing this all wrong. This is how you should do it. Like that is not the way you want to interact with the community. You will get shouted out immediately. Um, the way that you want to come in is basically be humble, learn about how things work, um, the culture of the community, and then start figuring out where you can where you can add value, where you can contribute to. So for me, I was working another development job full time, and I actually started on the marketing side of things. Um, I volunteered to go to a couple conferences to talk about Decred. Um, I made some YouTube videos. I made a, a short series on the Lightning Network, just a technical explainer. So just trying to find ways to add value to the project. And then after a couple months of that, um, I knew that I wanted to make the jump to full time. So I quit my job. This was actually before I even started contributing on the dev side at all. I quit my job and then just said, I'm going to focus full time on um, become a Decred developer and contributing, and that's what I did. Now, Luke, what are some of your long-term concerns for Decred in the future? So right now, we're still going through this process of working out a lot of the finer details of how the governance model works. Um, you know, procedures, uh, norms, things like that. Um, and I would be worried if we make the mistake of establishing any type of kind of... Uh, you know, governance details that entrench incumbents and encourage any type of rent seeking um, anywhere within the project, right? So we want, ideally, we want a, a decentralized project where new entrants um, have low barriers to entry to entering and contributing to Decred. Um, and that Competition is highly encouraged, you know, among whether it's corporate contractors or developers, you know, competition breeds excellence. And so any type of missteps that we may make that would entrench incumbents and discourage, um, you know, competition and encourage rent seeking, I think is, is something that might worry me long term. But I don't see, as of right now, I don't see anything that would do that. Um, but as we, it's just something we need to keep in mind as we establish kind of like these um, finer details of the governance model. Luke, so now what are some of the things that you are most optimistic about when it comes to Decred? So I think there's a lot of really underappreciated aspects of Decred that the market isn't taking to, into account right now. Um, one is this, the sheer amount of talent in the team. Um, Decred just has an extremely high quality dev team, um, especially the original Decred guys. 
uh, their their breadth of knowledge and their ability to develop across the entire stack, everywhere from you know starting with hardware and then moving on up with OSs and and everything above it. Um, it's just really I've. I've met very few people with that type of breadth of knowledge um, and have decades of kind of experience in contributing open source code. I mean, not many people know, but most of the original Decred guys met back in the day in the OpenBSD community. Um, and if you're not familiar, OpenBSD is a operating system. You can think of it as a competitor to Linux, but has an extreme focus on security and privacy. And then from there, they went from OpenBSD to Bitcoin, and then from Bitcoin to Decred. And then when you combine that level of knowledge with a platform like Decred, where you have a funding source, and then you have the ability to incorporate these hard fork changes over time, you're going to get some, or Decred is going to get some very cool technology that no other chain is really going to be able to compete with but I don't think that's going to become apparent for another, you know, three, four, five years. So now, give me the emotional state of your relation with Decred in one word. Uh, excited. <laughs> I just think there's a lot of cool stuff in the future um, lined up for Decred, and, and yeah. So now, Luke, we're going to get into a part of the show I like to call the Decred Bulletproof section, where I play devil's advocate. I've gathered some statements and some questions from Twitter and different sources online, uh, taking shots at Decred. So I'll start with the first. If Decred was to fail, what would be the cause of its death? So it would probably probably be um, a, some type of nation state level actor trying to take down the, the network or the, the chain. And it would probably have to involve, you know, using force to seize a combination of proof of work mining operations as well as, you know, the stake of large whales um, in order to basically just stop all forward progress of the chain. You know, that's something basically every project is still susceptible to, um, where we aspire to one day get to the point where that won't be possible, but we're, we're not there yet. What would an attack like that look like if the, the mining is sure. in different parts of the world? Well, mining, proof of work mining um, is inherently has this centralizing force because of the economies of scale that you get because of the fact that um, it's you really got to be in, in the mining manufacturing game to be an actual mining player these days. Um, and so because of that, uh, you'll, you're, you're t- going to have, um, tend to have a small number of large mining operations contributing a large percentage of the hash power. Um, so this is, you know, this is a problem in every proof of work network and so this is one of the the benefits of the hybrid model but at the same time if a government a large government really wanted was really motivated they could also just go and you know track down large known institutional whales people like that and just seize their assets um, and we're not we're not quite to the point where uh, that's not possible so now we'll get into the second one some say it's good for it to be difficult to change consensus decred does nothing special other than draw focus to a specific activation method baked into the protocol layer, which can be ported into any other project. Your thoughts? So I would say, first off, um, one, it is hard to change consensus on Decred, right? It requires 75% approval from the Decred stakeholders, which is a very high threshold to meet. Um, So one, it is hard. Now, there's this Bitcoin has taken the position of or adopting this no hard fork policy. Um, And there's a couple reasons used to defend this and to say that this no hard fork policy is a a feature, not a bug. Um, The first one being that if you, in a pure proof of work cryptocurrency, if you allow hard forks, um, what you're saying is that there is some group of people that have the authority to decide which hard forks are legitimate and which hard forks are not. So you essentially are granting this this kingmaker status to some group of people. Um, that is not the the actual coin holders. It's going to be either the developers, the the miners, or the economic nodes, or some combination of those three. Now the the issue with uh, and I, I agree, actually, with this this line of reasoning for a pure proof of work cryptocurrency. The reason being um, is that if you allow hard forks, what you're saying is that you're allowing some group of people to make decisions about risk, whereas 
that group of people is not going to be the same people that will feel the consequences of that risk, meaning it's going to be the devs, miners, or economic nodes making decisions about which forks are legitimate, but it's going to be the coin holders that will feel the consequences of that that decision. And so you're decoupling risk-taking from consequences of that risk-taking. Anytime you do that, um, bad things tend to happen. So for a pure proof of work cryptocurrency that aims to be a store of value, I don't uh, disagree with that line of reasoning. But that's not an issue in Decred because of the fact that we have this hybrid model where the stakeholders are the ones making the decisions. Uh, the people, the stakeholders, the people who are actively locking up their Decred and staking it, the ones with skin in the game, um, the people who feel the consequences of risk are the ones making decisions about risk. So the second reason that is usually used to defend the, the no hard fork position is that um, by never allowing hard forks, you are guaranteeing that the monetary policy will never change, which is uh, you know, a very a ideal uh, property of a store of value. Now, again, um, I, this is a valid argument, and I, I agree that the monetary policy should not change for a store of value, but you have to look at this as a, as a social contract, essentially. This is the people who are using Bitcoin are agreeing that they will never actually hard fork and change the monetary policy. There's nothing technically in the code that would, that would prevent that from happening. And so if this is just a social contract, then what that means is that... Um, Decred can have the same exact social contract. We don't need to have the no hard fork social contract to have the never changing the monetary policy social contract. If if we have a a uh, method for incorporating hard forks, we can allow net network upgrades, hard forks, and still say that we will never change the monetary policy. So still keeping uh, that store value use case um, intact. And then the third reason that's typically used to defend the no hard fork position is that. Uh, by never hard forking, you're minimizing the chance that any type of critical bugs will be introduced into the protocol. And again, a very valid reason. But if you have, um, you know, another way that can be used to minimize the chance of bu critical bugs being introduced is to have uh, the code thoroughly audited um, and tested and having just a conservative release cycle. And if you have a funding source to do that, it makes it much easier um, to to do all those things, have your code thoroughly reviewed, audited, and tested. Whereas in other networks that don't have this funding source, you don't necessarily have the resources to do that. Um, so on the flip side, you also have to look at the downside to adopting this no hard fork position, right? By saying you'll never hard fork, you're really limiting the types of upgrades that can be made to the network in the future, and you're limiting how the network can, would be able to respond to any type of threats that happen in the future. Um, and I don't even think long term that it is um, a reasonable assumption to make that Bitcoin will never need to hard fork. Um, I think that there will absolutely be scenarios that will in the future, maybe not in the next couple of years, but definitely in the next couple of decades that will force Bitcoin to hard fork. And when you do that, you get into all of the issues that we just talked about um, with the the risk taking the the developers the miners and the economic nodes making decisions about risk whereas the the coin holders will be the ones feeling the consequence of that risk so at the end of the day it just comes down to personal preference bitcoin was designed to be um slow moving and hard to change whereas decred was designed to be able to incorporate these changes and upgrade over time um, and ultimately we'll let the market decide which one um is is the the better store of value so now you mentioned decades what are some of the advantages that you see Decred has over BTC with a long enough time frame? So the main advantage is just Decred's ability to respond to threats in the future that require hard fork changes. So if we're talking in terms of years, I don't think anything's going to happen to Bitcoin. Um, you know, the network effects are just too strong. But if we're talking in terms of decades, then things become much more uncertain. If Bitcoin were ever in a situation that required a hard fork, you know, for example, SHA-256 will break one day and Bitcoin will have to hard fork away from it when it does. Well, when that happens, you get into all those problems that we talked about where you have uh, essentially these kingmakers making decisions about which hard forks are legitimate um, and the decoupling of the risk taking from the consequences of that risk taking. So you get into all of these governance issues that we talked about before. So in a situation like that, you know, Bitcoin is going to be, 
you know, 10x, 100x larger. So there's going to be a lot more money at stake. It's not going to be Roger Ver or Craig Wright um, pushing alternative narratives. It will be motivated nation state level actors with very deep pockets. Um, and the end result of something like that is very uncertain. Um, so if something were to ever happen to Bitcoin, I think that Decred would absolutely be the number or the, the store value contender to take its place. So now this is another argument that's that's made all the time. Uh, Bitcoin launched without a pre-mine. All other projects outside of Bitcoin are built around the financial interests of their creators. What are your thoughts on that? So yes, Bitcoin launched without a pre-mine, but the fact, the the end result was very similar to a small pre-mine. Um, meaning that because Bitcoin was so obscure when it first launched, you have a large number of coins uh, or a, a chunk of the total supply that ended up in the hands of a very small number of individuals, those early contributors. Um, and so Bitcoin did not have a pre-mine, but if the, if the end result is the same, um, you know, for example, if Satoshi does actually have a million coins, is that not this, uh, the same thing as a cryptocurrency network launching now where the initial team has a small pre-mine? Um, I don't, and this just gets into like the discussion of, you know, should a store of value have a pre-mine or not? And my, my opinion is that as long as one, it's transparent um, and it is not a huge pre-mine, I don't see any problem with incentivizing the, the team to continue the development of the protocol and to make the, the cryptocurrency valuable over the long term. It's all about incentive alignment. That's my stance as well. Um, transparency is key to me. It's, it's the most important. Now, here's a, here's a stab at our treasury. People will invest in things that make the world better. Whether it be time or money, they will invest. You don't need a dev fund embedded into your protocol to incentivize development. Yeah, 100% uh, disagree. So, well, okay, yes, there are certainly examples like Linux of open source projects that have won out, but the question is not whether uh, it's an uh, a unfunded open source project will win out against a funded closed source project. The question is whether an unfunded open source project will win out against a funded open source project. Um, and in Linux's case, right, it was open source versus closed source and open source won out in the end. But in cryptocurrencies case, it's uh, unfunded open source versus funded open source. Um, I think that's a completely different question. Um, I also, I also think that, uh, I, you know, it's great if you have the financial resources to be able to not have to worry about money and being able to contribute to something that, that you feel, um, you know, it benefits the world. That's awesome. But most people don't have those financial resources. Uh, one of the reasons I contributed to Decred is because it's, it was one of the few projects where I actually contribute to the core project and actually get paid for those. Um, that, that was a big deal to me. It was the only thing that made it actually possible for me to do it long term. Um, so, I also think that there's plenty of examples throughout the ecosystem where funding has been an issue, um, whether that's Ethereum or Grin or other projects. Um, yeah, at long term, I think there, that you absolutely have to have some type of, of built-in funding source. So now as we wrap up, Luke, what are your closing thoughts and a message you'd like to relate to newcomers and potential stakeholders? Yeah, so I would say just uh, get involved. You know, Decred's culture is centered around this concept of doers. Um, you know, working code is better than talking about code. So get involved and start start contributing. Well, Luke, I appreciate you taking the time to come on the show. And where can people find you? Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Um, so I'm on Twitter as Luke BP. I'm on Matrix, the Decred Matrix, as Luke BP. Um, that's where you can find me.